We just arrived from Chennai, and every time we travel, Rome is a health, I mean, a security hazard because all the security guys look at his bag always with great suspicion because they expect him to uh, have snakes. So, <laughs> so his reputation travels far ahead of him. Right now? Well, I used to carry snakes until they started this dreaded security and they sort of pat you all down. So I don't carry them anymore, promise. <laughs> so, um, uh, one, the one thing I have to say about Rom is that he is obsessed with reptiles, with snakes and crocodiles mostly, to a lesser degree with lizards and turtles, right? But the thing is, throughout his life, he's used that as his core interest and gone off in different directions, building different careers. So, do you want to list what the different jobs you've done? Well, other than being drafted in the U.S. Army and spending two years at that, uh, I sort of hurried back to India after a short stay in the United States, and uh, I, I wanted to set up a snake park, and lo and behold, I did it, Madras Snake Park. That was an overnight success and a million people came the first year, so I said, okay, we've got something here. People don't like snakes or they like snakes or they're scared of them, but they're always fascinated with them. So that's where it all started. Yeah. Well, um, from the snake park, it, uh, we started keeping a few crocodiles and lo and behold, they started laying eggs. So what do we do? Well, we have to start a crocodile farm, obviously. And that's the current Madras Crocodile Bank near Mahablipuram, which you've got to visit someday. And just as a side note, by the way, we've got a thousand surplus crocodiles, so anyone coming forward at the end who will accept at least a hundred, you can have them free. Okay, so I'm going to answer for you. What I was expecting was he's been a zoo manager, a filmmaker, um, what? Educationist, conservationist. What else? No, you're the one to say this. Um, and now proselytizer with snake bite. Well, that's true too. So, something you said sparked this off. So people generally are scared of snakes. And that's a good thing because it keeps you away from danger. It saves your life. You don't want to be messing with animals that could kill you. So that it has a key... Um, evolutionary reason why people are scared of snakes. So how come there's a person like you who has no fear of snakes? How does that work? What would happen in a primitive human society to someone like you? Well, I'm either nuts or I didn't follow the evolutionary line. I didn't evolve from monkeys and early primates. What say? And you evolved from what? Well, I, I don't have an answer to that <laughs> one. But go ahead. Uh, and um, there were also, um, so w looking at your career, what would you say was the most exciting um, period, work that you did? I think, uh, I mean, I've always been excited by Reptile. We already established that. I was very lucky to get wonderful jobs with the United Nations in countries like Ethiopia, Mozambique, Papua New Guinea, places where there were crocodiles and they were being hammered, basically slaughtered for their skins. And I got into this whole bandwagon of sustainable use of wildlife. And it was in New Guinea where I, I really learned the art of this. This was basically to set up village cooperative farms in village areas for people who did hammer crocodiles. They ate them, they sold their skins. But uh, we worked out a methodology where they would collect crocodiles, rear them for the skins, collect the eggs, let the, save the adults, not kill the adults, and the eggs, of course, would be converted into baby crocodiles, which would be reared for their skins. This is still to this, this was back in the 70s, and to this day, it's a million dollar industry there. Crocodiles are doing just fine, and village people are making an income. So here's, here was a positive use of wildlife, which I thought was really amazing and wonderful. I said exciting. How is that exciting? Oh, exciting, sorry. Uh, the exciting part of it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. 
I got to Mozambique, for example, and I was supposed to, first of all, find crocodile nests. We had to collect eggs. Okay, how did I do that? Well, being a United Nations employee, they said, uh, here's a helicopter if you need it. Helicopter if I need it, of course. So I jumped into the helicopter, and the pilot was a really cool young guy who, kind of like me, slightly wacky. And we went low over the riverbanks, and if we just hit the right season of the year when crocodiles were laying their eggs, the female crocodiles were sitting, basking next to where they had their nests. But I figured, now, wait a minute, we can't land there, so we're going to have to go on foot. Now, how are we going to figure this out? So the next trip, I came out with rolls and rolls of toilet paper. I know this sounds awful, but when we went over every site of a crocodile nest, we threw a roll of toilet paper down, which we cleaned up later, by the way, honest. And that way, we were able to find the nest when we went on foot. But to go on foot, there were hippos. We had to walk through papyrus well over our heads. We'd hear this <coughs> of a hippo just around the corner, not knowing what was going to happen. Had a couple of armed guards with me, of course, to protect me in case a hippo or an elephant got after us. But we ended up collecting 20 crocodile nests in that short period of time. This was wonderfully exciting. First of all, getting an overview of the Maromero floodplain, the Zambezi floodplains from a helicopter, all the wonderful animals, and succeeding in this act of uh, collecting all these crocodile eggs. So we started a project there as well. Yeah. Okay, so everyone would think that that's a very dangerous job to do. So what, in, in situations like that, what was the scariest experience you've had? I, I, uh, to, to, uh, to me, stark fear was when I was doing a similar thing in the Sundarbans, the largest mangrove swamp in the world of Bangladesh. Again, back in the 70s, and uh, we had to try to find crocodile nests there. This is the saltwater crocodile, rather different species, rather large and rather fond of human, uh, human beings as food. And uh, as I was wandering through the Sundarbans, again, I had a, a couple of armed guards behind me with old three-knot, three rusty, uh, muzzle, uh, not muzzle <laughs> sorry, bolt-action rifles. And I was actually more scared of the guys sort of letting off a shot by accident than I was of any crocodile. But the fact was that we were actually worried more about tigers than anything else. During the two-week period that I did that first survey, six people, local fishermen and honey collectors, were killed by tigers. I'm okay with mammals. They're all right. But uh, hey, when a tiger has his eyes on you and he's on the land, I mean, it's, a, it's different. With a crocodile, okay, just avoid the edge of the water. But the tiger was probably watching us going by and for, for one reason or the other, declined to uh, grab any of us. So survived that one. But the h heart thumping I can remember to this day as we walked, actually crouched and crawled through those swampy areas. Wow. Okay, so the brief I got here was to have a conversation with Ron, but we talk to each other all the time. So please feel free to interrupt and put your hand up if you have a question. Someone here, please. So in the meantime, by the time the mic comes to you, um, the Rom and I started living in this little place, a farm, give me two minutes, um, near a forest south of Chennai. And when we first moved there, I didn't know anything about anything. And we started having, I started having to deal with frogs moving into the house and scorpions and things like that. They were pretty, you know, it took some getting used to. And then a leopard moved in and I was like, oh my God. So to me, it was like no other place I've ever lived in my life. Yeah, she was a city girl, Chennai city girl. So my question to you was, have you ever lived in a place, since you've lived in several places in your life, uh, have you lived in a place with that range of well, never interactions? for that length of time. I mean, we set up field stations in the Andaman Islands. We set up one in Agumbe. Some of you might know about that one. And there are king cobras there, a wonderful snake, and uh, things like that. But actually living in a place, and we've been there 25 years now, and we put out camera traps. We've got photographs of all the porcupines and civet cats and, and the leopard who visits us now and then. So yeah, we're really very, very closely attached to that farm. It's more than a farm, much more. So if you feel 
it's on. So if you're filming a crocodile documentary, for example, what do you do if you get some great footage and the crocodile eats the camera? <laughs> yeah, well, even more fun was when my brother, who was the sound man, put his uh, sort of uh, sound, his uh, beautiful microphone down close to the crocs and one of them jumped up and grabbed it. He was very, very pissed off with us because that was a very expensive little item which he lost on that one. Did you get a refund from the crocodiles? Of course. <laughs> No, the thing with crocodiles is when one goes for one thing, all the others think, oh, that guy's got something really juicy, let me also go and see. So basically this thing was shredded in five minutes. <laughs> so, um, Well, what I wanted to do is, uh, when, when I first met Janaki, she was a film editor, okay? She was editing soaps, she was editing feature films, advertisement films, uh, she was pretty bored. So uh, I came to her with this proposition. I need some help. I need a showreel to prove to National Geographic that I'm a real good filmmaker and we can do some fantastic films together. And it must have worked, her showreel for me, because National Geographic gave us a contract. And what was the film? It was called The King Cobra. Everyone said to us, hey, you know, a King Cobra, when it's happy, it looks like this. When it's sad, it looks like this. When it's angry, it looks like this. How the hell are you going to make a film out of a creature with no personality whatsoever? But no, we went on. We, we were undaunted, and we did make the film, and it got an Emmy Award. We didn't even know what an Emmy Award was in those days. They asked, so they said, come to New York, and, uh, but make sure you bring a, a, a three-piece suit and a tie. I said, I can't, I can't be hassled with that. My mother was really teed off with me. You didn't go to New York to get your Emmy? No, they sent it in the post, no worries. <laughs> anyway, that was when I first met Janaki. And uh, since then, we made about well, half a dozen films for National Geographic. And uh, yeah, some of them were very well received. And that gave us a lot of inspiration. Now she's a writer, permanently. And she lives in the right place for writing, that's for sure. Yeah, so um, I was, when I started writing, I had spent 10 years as Rom's secretary as well. So my world was entirely reptiles and I just had to come up for air. <laughs> so I went out and did some um, work with leopards and elephants to see how large um, mammal conservation and research works. So that gave me a good insight into um, how India, India's wildlife is doing, what various kinds of studies are uh, going on around the country and I think that's where I draw my stories from. But Hello? more importantly I think you went into the human wildlife conflict aspect of it, especially with both leopards and elephants. Yeah, so that's what everyone thinks. So when uh, you have people and wildlife, you know, the conflict is inevitable because that's, the way, that's what we see in the newspapers and that's exactly where I started as well. Like how do we sort this out so people and wildlife get along well? But then I started stumbling on all these instances of people getting along very well with wildlife but nobody celebrates that fact. and we could do more of that, so I, I, I'm headed in that direction now, chronicling all those instances of uh, people who actually sacrifice a part of their livelihoods and uh, adjust their way of life to uh, including wildlife in their landscapes. And these are not national parks or sanctuaries, these are villages and fields and places like that. So it's, it's there, it's just that we need to give to make them feel like they're doing something good for this country's wildlife. Otherwise, you know, we're just losing that whole tradition. I, uh, I have a question, actually. I have a group of friends who have a, a tract of land, uh, several of them. It's not just one piece I'm talking about. And it's about 10 acres. And they would really like to bring wildlife into that property. So apart from just leaving it alone, is there anything that you actively do to to encourage this kind of private space where people, where animals can come and grow and all that? Mm, uh, go ahead, because that's a 
I don't think we do anything more than just create the space. If it is good enough, they will come. Drinking water, maybe? Yeah, source of water. But even that isn't necessary. I think it's planting a variety of trees, which yeah. is where we went kind of nuts on that. And we're looking at all local species and we, we planted a huge variety of trees. The local farmers thought we were nuts and they were trying to figure out what kind of money are they going to make out of the trees. But no, it was basically because we did want birds and, and all the other associated wildlife to move in with us. And they did. <laughs> yeah, also beware. It's, you always have unintended consequences. You think you're doing one thing and you'll get something else that you're not prepared for. So When Janaki lost her favorite dog, we were wondering how the heck did that dog disappear? We put out a... a, a a complaint with the police department to file an FIR that the dog, had, so we could put an ad in the paper and offer a reward for her dog. So uh, when the dog was found, actually it was just the carcass and the, the leopard had taken it and eat it, eaten it. So I went back to the police inspector and I said, uh, actually the dog was taken by an animal so it wasn't stolen by a human being. And the police inspector said, ah, leotard. Uh, I, you can't laugh at a police inspector. I mean, I knew what he wanted to say, but the idea of a leotard sort of skulking through like the Pink Panther in a leotard or something like that. So that became the family joke. Yeah, so we put out uh, camera traps to understand what this leopard was about. And we, you can recognize leopards by the arrangement of spots. So we got a shot of the guy just a few months ago and we were wondering he must be about 15, 16 years old now and we don't know how old wild leopards get to and he's got a little bit, you know, his uh, ears are a bit moth-eaten, his whiskers are all a bit blunt and, I mean, broken off and he looks a little bit hmm. getting there, happy for him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. is. Sorry, yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, I was recently switching through a couple of TV channels and I saw an image of you and the Irulas in the Everglades. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you share your experiences working with the Irulas through the years? And are they a dying kind of tribe in terms of what they're doing? Very true. And the fact is that, you know, tribal livelihoods are not compatible with our laws and, you know, Wildlife Act and all this kind of stuff today. Mm -hmm. But I met the Irulas way, way long time ago in the late 60s. and, and formed a very strong bond with a very large group of them who were in those days catching snakes for the skins. Well, we did quite a bit of uh, work to try to stop the skin industry because 10 million snakes were being killed every year. So by stopping the industry, that we're, we're putting them out of business. So then we got them going with the idea of extraction of venom for the production of antivenom. And to this day, the Irdala Snake Catchers Cooperative supplies most of the venom used for antivenom. They are wonderful people and taking them to Florida to the Everglades was something we had thought about for a long time and only finally managed to convince the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission to uh, support our trip over there. It was a lot of fun showing the American snake hunters with the air-conditioned cars and a case of beer and loud music on the radio. That's how pythons are caught. But the Irlas walking through the bush, sort of slithering through the <laughs> the mud and s everything and finding those pythons. It was wonderful to watch them and it was a wonderful learning experience for those American snake hunters too. It was great, wonderful. Hi. Um, starting a croc park or maybe a snake park today in 2018 itself seems so daunting to me. So you started something in maybe in the 70s. So can India Steve Irving tell us some experiences of starting a croc park in India and all the red tape you had to go through. Well, I wasn't joking about the thousand crocodiles. I, I, we really do have a thousand surplus crocodiles, and we're giving them free to anybody who wants to start a crocodile farm. I'm serious. It's a wonderful, we get 500,000, five lakhs of visitors every year there. So it's even, you know, commercially very viable operation. Bangalore, great place for a croc farm. Any takers, please see me afterwards. The challenges. The challenges, of course, are the Central Zoo Authority, the usual government rigmarole that we'd have to go through, but it's all beatable. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, one thing I found, I mean, I, I don't know, know both of you personally, but I follow you through books and, you know, her Twitter uh, account. So, 
a, a bit common uh, thing about both of you is, uh, you know, I also know Pradeep Krishna and Arundhati Roy, they're married together, and somehow there's some similarities in the way they started off. They, they also started in, with a film, and then Pradeep is also a conservationist, Arundhati is an author like you. And, and one more thing is that, you know, just like you and Pradeep, both have a very, uh, very non-serious view towards conservation, at least how it looked from outside, you know, which is a bit different from the many of the scientists we see in Bangalore who are too serious, too worried about everything. And so, what you, I, I want to know, what's your view on conservation and science? How do you think it should be done? I mean, and yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting question. I'm not really quite sure how to... Uh, I'm a bit of a laid-back person, and uh, I think I've influenced Janaki in that way, too. She is a bit of a pistola, as we say in Spanish down in Mexico, but uh, we look at things a little bit, uh, let's say, coolly, and, uh, but taking all the facts into account, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean, because both Pradeep and Arundhati are very good friends of us, and I see the parallels, because uh, Pradeep quit filmmaking to, and taught himself to identify trees and go into tree planting, and I gave up filmmaking to start writing, so yeah, and both Pradeep and Ram together are a riot, so it's a, yeah, there are some yeah. parallels there. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, I have two questions to you. Uh, we always have a conflict between conservation and infrastructure development. So how do we balance it? And the second question is, uh, can you please tell us more about your Agumbe experience? Thank you. I can talk about Agumbe. What about the development thing? I, mean I think anyone uh, in conservation will tell you they are not um, actually polar opposites. You can actually plan in a way that you can have your trees as well as your development because you're not ever going to be able to survive if you didn't have the natural world. So you're going to have to take that into account and plan around it, include it in your um, management plan. So I was talking to so somebody in the Andamans, there is this uh, crocodile conflict there. Crocodiles are coming back after a long time. And uh, all the tourism guys are worried that tourists are going to stay away, they are not going to use their beaches, snorkeling is a hazard now. And they all want the crocodiles removed. And uh, one person said to me that he wants Andaman Islands to become like Singapore. What he doesn't realize is Singapore has a big forest within its city limits. And we don't see that. We only see the glitzy part, the malls and the shopping and the highways. And that's what we see as the aspirational goal. We don't see the other part where they have their forest, they've got their wonderful, there are otters running through the center of the city. Here, we have to even hunt for otters in national parks. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So we could have both. Yeah. Uh, Agumbe? Yes. <coughs> as far as Agumbe is concerned, I fell in love with Agumbe in the early 70s. I was told by the author Kenneth Anderson, if you want to find a king cobra, go to Agumbe. And I went there, and yes, in 24 hours, I found a male and a female king cobra, and they became the sort of star attractions at the Madras Snake Park. And I just, I really fell in love with that place. And if you go there, I'm sure you will too. It's a wonderful area, a beautiful rainforest, the highest rainfall in South India. So, uh, I mean, okay, leeches are a bit of a problem. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, bird life and everything else, it's really marvelous. So I was very, very lucky back in 2004 to find a piece of land there. And we set up the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station. You're all very welcome to come and visit us there. Yeah, so there are two parts to that. So Rom loves the king cobras, I love the people. And they are amazing. There are no other people like them in the world. So there are king cobras that walk in, I mean, crawl into their house. And often they are in the bathroom because it's cool, there's water to drink, and they, if they're shedding their skin, they can stay there for a week. So these people, will not use the bathroom for three days, four days, use the neighbors, and then when they just cannot do without their bathroom, then they call us, can you please help remove this snake? And they don't want any harm done to the snake, you just leave it outside and they would, if there is a chipped 
concrete edge in the bathroom, they'll put a gunny sack so it doesn't hurt itself. And often the female king cobras make a nest in their garden and one chap whose garden it was wanted to make a shed so the rain didn't fall on the king cobra and inconvenience it. And his daughter was a, a zoology student and so we gave her the, uh, the temperature probes and stuff like that and she would religiously write down the morning, evening, afternoon and evening temperatures of this king cobra nest. The one thing they did ask us when the babies hatch, will you kindly take them a little further away? Cause yeah, that's how they start. But once you start looking at the temperature every day, you start developing this bond. And then they say, please don't take our king cobras away. Please let them be. <laughs> Wonderful. So Fantastic. the counterpoint to that is that we have friends in Thailand studying king cobras, and they put radios in them to see where they go. All of them are getting eaten up by people. So that's the counterpoint. We could be like that, but we are not. So that's what I was saying earlier about how we have to learn from our people more than looking to the West for conservation models. Fantastic tolerance. So uh, as a kid who grew up in Chennai in the 70s and 80s, first of all, thank you for making my yeah. summer vacations fascinating. I spent a lot of time at the snake park. So my question really is, uh, clearly you've been to several places with you know, tremendous amount of wildlife. How did you decide to pick India? Well, why India? Well, I started here because I grew up here. I came when I was seven years old with my stepfather, who is an Indian, and uh, we lived originally in Bombay. I went to school, did all my schooling in Kodekanal, and uh, I went to the States for a while. It was very interesting, a lot of fun to be there, but home is where the heart is. I came back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he is really Indian at heart. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Excellent work. Um, had a thought about dogs, stray dogs in India. How about getting something like a pound built up so and get the waste food thrown there so that dogs would be in a pound or something and you know the dog bite problem can be solved in some way. Is there something you would think on those lines? <laughs> I'm, I'm a wild animal person. I, I mean, I, I know there are lots of people out there interested in the dog situation, and I hope they will find a solution, but not me. <laughs>